Okay, Paul, I'm going to start now. Okay. Hi, everybody. So I'm just going to give it a second for everybody to get logged in there. Just so I can see everybody's in. Fabulous. Okay, I'm just going to... Okay. One second. Okay, hi, everyone. So um, welcome to the GA, Tyne and Weir branch, um, and to our talk today, which is um, how to teach climate breakdown with Paul Turner. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Louise Corbin, the Vice Chair of the Tyne and Weir branch of the Geographical Association. Just so that you know, everyone is welcome to attend our events, whether you're a GA member or not. Um, it is free. But donations are welcome and we encourage we do encourage you to join the GA. It's an, obviously an excellent organisation that's got lots of resources that people can use. Um, we're very keen to hear from you about topics that you would find useful in our lecture series. So please feel free. We obviously have the chat function or you can email us. Our email addresses are on the screen um, for myself, Brenda and for Amy. Um, feel free to email us if there's any areas of interest that you would be interested in hearing about. Um, also, as well as an excellent resource, we've got the GA's Geography Education Online or the GEO website. Uh, that's really useful for year 12 and 13, um, especially for catching up on material that you might have missed. Uh, for example, last year, it'll be really helpful for you during obviously this lockdown. And the materials and services are excellent quality. Um, they are cheaper if you're a GA member, so you can access those on their website. Um, it is nice for speakers to have an audience rather than talk into the void of cyberspace. So if you if you do want to leave your camera on, that's absolutely fine. We would ask that you all mute though, so that there isn't anybody um, talking during the lecture, and that Paul's going to do. Um, the will be the chat function will be left on. So if you have any questions, uh, Paul will be stopping during the chat to ask if to ask a question and interact with the audience. But also if you've just got a question that you want to answer, just add it in the chat function. I'll then collate all of those for a question and answer session at the end, or you can just wait till the end and you can post your question in then um, for, that set, for that session. We do give certificates for your attendance at this event. So if you email myself um, on louisemarleycoburn at gmail.com, I'll get you an, uh, a certificate of attendance sent out to you sent out here that's excellent for you cast and um, obviously it's great for your cv um, just to say that you've been attending these events as part of our lecture series um, and then just before we get started i just want to introduce paul then so paul a radical geographer today is going to be doing his lecture about how to teach climate breakdown paul's background um, he worked as a head of geography at a school in hampshire um, for the past five years and is now working as a freelance climate crisis educator, working to inspire teachers to teach um, to teach this subject. Paul recently helped create a four-part climate course backed by the Eden Project called How to Talk About the Climate Crisis to Anyone in a way that makes a difference. And with that in mind, this is what this talk is all about. Um, so in November 2019, 11,000 scientists published an open letter declaring clearly and equivocally that planet Earth is facing a climate emergency. So this talk is, I suppose, directed at geography teachers, but also for anyone interested in climate. Um, it's a must, you know, it's a must-see lecture, really, for to heed the message of what and how we can teach this subject. So we're going to have a look today at how to summarise the science of climate breakdown, and explore alternative ideas for teaching climate change so that it can actually make a difference to our students and in our classrooms. There's gonna be a variety of free tools and resources um, that can be shared with the attendees as well. So with that in mind, I'm gonna hand over to Paul now, um, who will take us through this, um, obviously was gonna be a very, very exciting lecture. So thank you very much, Paul. Hello. Um, did you just want to unshare your screen. Excellent. Okay. Um, so before I start, I just wanted to give you a sense of the way that I want to manage this. So I'm going to bring a bit of a flavour of what we do at AIM High. Um, so AIM High is um, a sort of online school in essence, um, partly instigated by um, 
lockdown, but also the world that we live in at the moment. Um, and what we try and do at AIM High is um, use online learning in a kind of innovative way. And hopefully you'll get a flavor of that with some of what we're doing, or I'll show you in a second. Um, but one of the main features, we're going to use the chat quite frequently. So in order to make sure that everyone is happy with how to use the chat, I would like you just to name your favorite uh, mammal. So if you just name your favorite mammal in the chat. Okay, leopard, interesting. Meerkat, uh, we've got rabbit, dog, elephant. Excellent, a good spread, a good spread. Um, okay, so let me just share with you. Here we are. Okay, so um, the premise of what I'm going to talk about this, how to teach the climate breakdown, hopefully I'm going to convey this sense of urgency, but also as well as this sense of urgency, the um, the autonomy and the agency that we have as teachers and at the heart of what I'm trying to get across is this idea that we might feel like um, exams and examination has an important part to play in what we're doing and that there is there is a lot of prescription in terms of the education system um, but actually there are pockets um, particularly when we are stood in our classroom or you're sat in front of a computer um, online learn or online teaching um, that you have the potential to um, tailor the words you say so language is something that is really important um, let me just stop sharing for a minute actually so um yeah my first first kind of key point that i just wanted to get out as soon as possible was the language that we use in the classroom is um unless you work in a school that's scripted and there are schools that are scripted um you have the power to to choose the language you use and that can be particularly powerful choosing the right words and in this case the right words are potentially climate crisis or climate breakdown rather than climate change um, I'll give you a little uh, story. One of the things I've done over the last few days is um, I visited the, uh, the GA website and thought, oh, wouldn't it be interesting to just search some key terms to so see how frequently do they appear on the GA website? Um, any guesses, if you use the chat, how many times do you think the words climate crisis appear on the, the, um, the GA website? Oh, Katie, you, you've, Hannah, you got it. Um, zero. Um, climate crisis doesn't appear. Um, yes, climate change. Now, um, you might think, well, oh, that's because the GA follow the science and they are led by what um, geographers are publishing. But that's not true. That um, if you were to go and visit a geography department at any university now, they are talking about climate crisis and the climate breakdown. And that is the language they use. Um, and actually, it's true also of um, the BBC, of The Guardian, that this language is not seen as hyperbole. It's not seen as exaggeration. This is, these are the technical terms that are being used. And so, yes, um, and I I'll point to this later on, um, exam boards and maybe textbooks don't use that language. Um, but I think the reason that, that exam boards and uh, textbooks don't use that language is because they were published um, or, or constructed maybe five, 10 years ago. Um, and so as a result, they've not yet kept up. Um, and so, yes, this is fastly evolving as well. And, and that's part of the message. Um, OK, we'll jump back. Um, there's, there are a couple of other key points, but I wanted to make that clear that language was an important one. Um, so this image here, this is me on my bicycle. So something I'm also doing is I work part time for an organization called Sustrans, um, uh, promoting cycling and walking. And also that's sort of linked to exploring air quality. Um, so I spend a lot of time on bicycle um, and behind me is a banner. And that banner is something called the warming stripes. And I've taken that and toured around a number of schools and, and also village halls and, and public squares and all sorts of places in order to use that as a as a tool of communication um, and actually I've, I've proposed that maybe um, it was only about 50 or 60 pounds to have this banner printed up and um, I'll show you the link to this image um, in a minute and actually you could get it for specific regions so you, should, you could get it for the north of England you could get it for, for Europe you could get it for all sorts of things but um, what it shows is variation in global temperature from um, a mean and it's a really powerful way of conveying information that isn't just numbers or isn't a bar chart or a pie chart 
Um, so that's something that we might talk about in a minute as well. And it might be that you choose to print this and have it in your classroom. So um, in my department, we had this at the back of a classroom and it was um, a relatively cheap way to, to, to decorate a classroom in, in quite a dramatic sense. Okay. Um, I also then wanted to take a minute to obviously put what we're talking about in the context of our current situation. So we've found ourselves in another lockdown. Um, this cartoon has um, been shared uh, quite widely across the internet. And um, it's a play on something that actually was initially didn't include these three waves. It was initially just um, maybe COVID-19 and people have added more and more waves progressively. Um, but it's interesting to think what this image suggests that yes um you know it's sort of at the moment in the immediacy coronavirus seems all encompassing um and obviously it's dramatically changed the way that we teach um and we kind of conduct our everyday lives um but actually this is a moment to reflect and um it's interesting to think actually how fundamentally we've changed our lifestyles very much overnight almost um and also how governments have also shifted their focus and um, shifted funding. And it's interesting then to think, well, things like climate change, um, they're maybe not happening at the moment in such um, a kind of dramatic and immediate uh, sense for us. Um, but it, down the line and in the coming sort of decade or even closer, um, we as a society need to respond and what the way that we've dealt with coronavirus um, kind of almost sets a precedent and it proves that we are capable of changing our behaviour very fundamentally, you know, um, very quickly, and for governments to quickly shift their focus and provide funding for all sorts of means. So um, th there is almost a message of hope in there, potentially, that um, if we can do it for something like coronavirus, then maybe we can do it for something like climate change. Um, so that might be something that you take, take from this. Um, there's similarly, there's this sort of image here as well. Um, it, 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 what I'm trying to propose as well is that maybe people reflect on that relationship between coronavirus and climate change. And it might be at the moment that people feel like climate change is taking a back seat. Uh, it might be almost as well for, for the students that you teach that they feel that I've not got you know, mental space in order to think about something like climate change. Um, but actually, um, it's important to try and shift that narrative and to actually get them to think um, about the way that coronavirus and the way that society has responded um, can kind of almost be mirrored and reflect and tell us something about the way that we respond to climate change. Um, okay. Um, this also sits within this radical geographer message. And um, in essence, this is about um, shifting away from business as usual. So part of the message is, and the, the rhetoric is that the status quo and the way that we've always done things um, potentially hasn't produced the best results. And if anything has put us in a not particularly good situation. Um, and so doing things, and this is also true wider in sort of wider society, that doing things the way that we've always done them haven't uh, produced necessarily the best outcome. And we can also then reflect that in the classroom and in terms of um, education, that potentially the way that we teach um, is not necessarily producing the best results. It's not um, making a sort of happy and healthy world. Um, and, and therefore, again, coronavirus um, hopefully is getting everyone to reflect on the way that they're teaching, but also um, it's sort of forcing us to reflect on the examination system and the idea that we hinge so much on terminal examination. And then it gets us maybe to reflect on the why are we teaching? Why are children in the classroom learning? What's the purpose of all of this? And as much as um, it's a very much overwhelming situation and there is a, so much to take on board that hopefully there is space for you to think about that as well. Um, this is then, um, was it last GA conference? We, there was a group of um, geography teachers who got together and we produced something called the Radical Geographer's Handbook. Um, and that's still kind of publicly available. It was something that we self-published online. Um, what I will say as well is that um, after the lecture, I will share all of the slides within the chat. So I'll share a link to the slides and all of the images within the presentation are linked. So you'll be able to access all of the resources. Um, Okay, climate change then. Um, 
it's interesting that um, in the media, even though things are beginning to change or have changed, particularly maybe in relation to things like the Extinction Rebellion activities um, and people like Greta Thunberg, um, the narrative is still very much that there is some element of debate. But the reality is that um, this 99% figure is actually maybe slightly incorrect. It's, it's almost 100% of scientific evidence suggests that climate change that we are seeing over the last sort of 140, 150 years is linked to human activity. Um, it is human induced. So there is absolutely no doubt that climate change is or isn't happening. It is happening. And then um, where then people think that maybe the debate lies, and there's, it's interesting to see public opinion and surveys on this, is that still there is large, or there is a large kind of swathe of doubt in the public perception of this when really there shouldn't be. That's the scientific evidence suggests that this is pretty much 100% um, human induced. And I'll, I'll kind of show you some more links about that later. Um, but one of the ones that was then mentioned in the introduction was this idea that um, this was back in November um, of actually this was 2019. So this is still a couple of years ago now, this idea that 11,000 scientists released this open letter and so um, they are using language like climate crisis. And so what I want you to think about then is if you feel like climate crisis is something that sounds quite extreme to you and that you're reluctant to use in the classroom, well, actually, it's the language that is being used by the scientists or the scientific community at the moment. Um, and similarly, it's the same sort of language that's being used by politicians and policymakers. And so therefore, we should really be pulling that into our classroom and be um, kind of following suit in essence. Um, actually, let's just take a second um, to do something slightly different. Um, have you got a piece of paper near you? So see if you can find a plain piece of paper. Or if it's a lined piece of paper, it doesn't matter. Now, if I were to keep folding this paper, so if I folded it in half and then folded it again, and this might be something you could do with your piece of paper, how many times do you think I could fold it until I couldn't fold it anymore? So how many times, if you write, okay, someone's done this before, yes. <laughs> there is a, a physical limit in essence, because every time you fold this piece of paper, you are doubling the thickness. So under sort of the limits of science in essence, um, you can only fold it seven times. Now, there is a world record for folding a piece of paper, which is actually 11 times, and that's a really big, uh, very thin piece of paper. Um, this, though, is quite a good analogy. Um, now, if I said to you, um, let's ignore physics, if I could continue to fold this piece of paper and fold it in a way that it kept doubling every time I folded it, how many times would I need to fold it until it was the thickness of the earth? To have a guess, how many times could you or would I need to fold this until this piece of paper became the thickness of the earth? Throw in some numbers, have wild guesses. Yeah, so Suzanne, there's some good. Hannah there, 3,582. Let's see if we can get a few more. Oh, okay, yeah, there's a, there's, I can't even read that one. Was that 10,000 or maybe is it, a, uh, yeah, is that six zeros? So we've got a million. Um, okay, the reality is it would only take about 130 folds to get this piece of paper to the thickness of the earth. Similarly, it would only take um, a couple of hundred to get it to the thickness of the Milky Way, to the galaxy that we live in. Um, now, the reason to talk about that is because this is quite a good analogy and reference to the idea of um, exponential growth, of the idea that things grow at an increasing rate or they increase at an increasing rate. So as well as obviously that being the case with coronavirus and the idea that we talk about this sort of R number, um, it's difficult and this has been displayed by the numbers people have guessed. People have guessed quite high in comparison to what the actual number is. And that shows that um, it's not that, that you know, there's anything wrong with the people who've guessed. It's actually just all of us innately as human beings underestimate how quickly things can grow. And that's just to do with how we've evolved. 
So um, the reason this is appropriate for the climate system is because the climate warms um, at a well, at the moment it's it's warming at an exponential rate and it's difficult for us to comprehend that because it doesn't fit in with the way that we as humans kind of understand the world around us. Um, there is another way that you can use a piece of paper as a good analogy of the climate system. So um, if you think of this as the sort of atmosphere so we all understand the greenhouse effect, which is natural and is needed to keep the earth at a habitable temperature. So we're really fortunate that we've got the greenhouse effect. And this is also often a misconception of students that they get confused between the enhanced greenhouse effect and the idea that humans are adding gases to the atmosphere and increasing the density of gases. But um, if we were to add energy or um, gases, to the atmosphere, we can gradually move this piece of paper up through our fingers. Now, what do you think is going to happen when I reach a certain point? What happens to the piece of paper? So as I gradually move it up further and further, it suddenly flops. It moves to another state. So this is a good example of how we're moving between different um, uh, kind of stable states in essence, that it's stiff and kind of relatively stable. It then becomes less stable. It begins to sort of wobble around and then it just flops. Yeah, it completely goes and changes. Um, yeah, it falls over. And so by adding energy to the atmosphere and to the climate system, we are making the system less stable. Now, if we said, OK, you know, we've got all of these targets to become net carbon zero or neutral or whatever language you want to use. Um, what we're going to need to do is start to remove some of the uh, gases from the atmosphere so I can pass that piece of paper back through my hands. Now, the reality is we have to go a very long way back for it to return to the state it was in before. So again, this is also another good analogy for this idea that it's not going to be that simple once we when we can use language like tipping points as a good way to describe this. Once we pass those tipping points, we have a sort of runaway, um, it's often described as a hothouse earth, where the temperature, um, there's lots of uncertainty about where that temperature will reach. But in order to get back to the stable state we were in before, we have to go a very long way. Okay, so um, paper, that's a good way that you can kind of um, illustrate some of these ideas. And hopefully you can see as well that, um, online learning can kind of be added to with with um, kind of resources and bits of paper that you've got around you. And there's lots of other good examples like that that you can you can kind of use analogies. OK, I'm going to get back to the slides. Uh, OK, so this language here. These three sentences. These are the sentences that I think every single teacher, regardless of subject, regardless of, of, of kind of where they are in the world, should say at the beginning of any um, weather or climate or climate change or climate crisis topic. And these three sentences actually come from um, um, from uh, kind of the scientific community. And I'm going to show you a report that this was linked to. But it's the science is clear, we are facing an unprecedented global emergency and we must act now. And there is a consensus around that language. It is agreed that those statements are um, accurate. And it comes from this report by Emily Grossman, who um, this, and I'll just show you the report here, is what I would suggest is one of the best and most up-to-date summaries of the climate science. Um, and I'll just show you um, the, here is the contents. So if you have, if you're planning a lesson and you're thinking, ah, I wanna make sure I've got the right information here or the most up-to-date, something like, uh, why can we be so sure the earth is heating? You might be thinking about the temperature rise. So if we go quickly to, um, page nine here. This is fully referenced with diagrams. Um, it is all like peer reviewed science. So um, this is all kind of reputable science. This is all can be relied on by teachers. Um, but it's a really snappy summary. So this is the go to document um, that I suggest um, teachers use. And it's called Emergency on Planet Earth. And it was compiled by Dr. Emily Grossman. Um, 
Okay, this is the next one. This was the diagram that I showed before. It was the banner that was at the back of the, behind me when I was on the bicycle. Now this is with um, kind of axis titles. So it gives you a, a reference here. So it's potentially a little bit more useful for a teaching context. And what it shows is from 1850 to the present day, um, and uh, white is a sort of, is the mean, is the global average temperature mean. And the, the darker the blue, is the colder from that mean and the the darker the red is the warmer from that mean and um i mean we can probably congratulate ourselves we've we've had the 10 warmest years in the last 10 years um to, uh, 2020 was um the warmest year on record on par with 2016 um, and we continue to break records in essence um now, what's interesting from this as well it is it illustrates this idea that um, the climate or the temperature in particular fluctuates. So the climate has always changed. And that's obviously something that's important to convey to, to students. And um, it's maybe something that is a bit clearer when you start to look at longer time frames. Um, so this is quite a good resource. Uh, this is called CO2levels.org. And what it shows is, let me just... Uh, this one here. Okay, um, it allows you to zoom in and out of different time frames, and I think that's one also an interesting perspective is to understand that um, this the climate change story tells you something different depending on the time frame you're looking at it. So you can look at it at it from a um, um, a sort of over the last 140 years. So you can look at the very rapid growth or change that we've seen over the last. Um, kind of a couple of hundred years, but we can also um, zoom out and we can look at it in the context of hundreds of thousands of years. So within the context of that glacial into glacial cycle, and you can look then at the maybe the, the theory and um, the explanation that is very well understood about this idea of um, going from um, relatively uh, warm periods to relatively cold periods. Um, what this also allows you to do is overlay the temperature record, which is an interesting one as well. You can then see the correlation between the carbon dioxide concentration. Um, so at the moment we're at 412, maybe 415 parts per million. Um, and that is particularly un unprecedented, particularly in human history, but you've got to go pretty far back in the geological record in order to find um, both carbon dioxide concentrations that high, but also um, temperature. The other thing I'd like to just um, sort of emphasize as well is um, under that idea that, that the climate and temperature has always changed, the thing that we really want to, to hook students and the clear message we want to engage with them is it's the rate of change. So it's how quickly both the carbon dioxide concentration and the temperature has changed over this, in geological terms, very, very short period of time. You know, the world is 4.5 billion years old. Humans have only been around for a relatively, you know, extremely small period of, of time in relation to that. And we've had such a significant change in, in terms of these variables um okay um so i have this question um is climate change having an impact now quite a simple answer to that is there what do people think if you throw that into the chat <laughs> yes but yeah, that's interesting. So not under people's noses. And maybe this is what I'm trying to get at. And I mean, uh, par partly also the reason I brought this up is because the language that's used often doesn't convey this. Um, and there's lots of examples where um, if, you know, very prominent websites, um, sources, uh, news articles, talk about the impacts we will have and the future impacts. And yes, there is research into future impacts, but if we emphasize the language of future and will, what we negate is this idea that we are experiencing it now. So it's important to emphasize the idea of the now and the current impacts that we are seeing. Um, so, 
yes, we can we can kind of forget that idea that climate change is having an impact now. And a lot of the language people use push it off into the future. So there's this idea of othering as well. So as well as it being into the into the sort of future and other generations, we also have this idea of spatially people push it to the other in the sense of it's the global south or it's people in other parts of the world rather than um, people in the UK or in, in wealthy parts of the world. And that, that's something we'll explore again in, in a minute. Um, now, there is lots of scientific evidence. This is from the Met Office. Each year they convey the state of UK climate. And this is evidence to clearly link climate change with impacts now. So again, if you are doing a weather and climate topic, um, surely this um, should be part of that. This idea of really clearly spelling out the impacts we are seeing in the UK you know, over the last few years, and, and in particular, um, this one's 2019, of how our weather is changing. And this idea that we are having maybe um, more intense periods of rainfall. So we're, we're getting weather, uh, wetter weather. We're getting um, sort of less cold periods. So the likelihood of snow becomes less um, probable. Uh, these are things that, that, that actually maybe students would be interested in as well, because then they can maybe see how that impacts them directly. You know, the chances of them having a snow day become less and less likely because of climate change. Um, this is another very good website as well that then puts that on a global perspective. So this is a collation of a whole variety of scientific reports carried out um, or sort of compiled by Carbon Brief. And what it allows you to do is to click on an extreme weather event and have a look at the, at the um, its relationship with uh, climate change. So this one looks at the Northern European summer heat wave of 2018, particularly in terms of Ireland. And it says it was made more severe or more likely because of climate change. And it might be that you have um, case studies or, or named examples or extreme weather events that you already look at. And this could be an extra dimension to say, actually, let's have a look at um, how climate change impacts on that. Um, and this is also then Another key message is this idea that climate change should not be taught in isolation. It shouldn't be a topic that is done at Key Stage 3. Um, it's something that should permeate every single topic you explore because, you know, as, as geographers, we all understand this, the idea of an interconnected world and the interrelationship. So um, this is a good way that you can do that and start to bring it into other topics. Um, OK. Uh, another question. So thinking more broadly then about education in schools, which subject do you think best teaches the climate and ecological emergency? So throw in a subject into the chat. Okay, Hannah's suggesting PSHCE, KT Geology, interesting. I guess the geology one, if anyone's seen um, the Christmas lecture series, um, there were three lectures. One of them was all around sort of earth sciences and geology, which was a really good, showed the relationship with climate change. Sciences focus too much on the science of it. Okay. The reason I ask this question is because one thing that we did last year um, as a group of teachers is we carried out a piece of scientific um, research looking at the language that was used in each of the um, syllabuses um, and for both GCSE and A-level across all subjects. So we did some analysis of the language and looked at some key terms. And what we used that to do um, was we created a sort of climate and ecological emergency score to actually kind of try and rank subjects by which ones best addressed this um, topic. Um, and it was interesting, partly because um, it showed that the very few subjects include language which relates to the climate and ecological emergency. Um, now, I'll show you this then. This was our, these are our overall results. And what we found was um, because we were talking about both the climate and ecological emergency, it was actually biology that best um, conveyed that. 
So we looked at a broad spectrum of terms and yeah, it was biology that best or um, kind of best addressed it. It was very closely followed by geography. And actually when we did the analysis just for the climate emergency, yes, geography was the one that conveyed that best. Um, but it's interesting that words like biodiversity are very sparse in um, geography syllabuses. Um, what you might also see though is that Yes, there are other subjects like maybe English or you might think of any subject has some sort of relationship to climate change. And I know um, within schools I've worked in the past, English teachers have looked at maybe the um, uh, persuasive techniques of someone like Greta Thunberg, or they've looked at a book which is about climate change or a story and, and explored that within their subject context. But under this analysis, we were looking at the syllabuses. And in reality, there were only three subjects that really genuinely addressed this at either GCSE or A-level. Um, and it was only physics that, that was sort of very sparse of all the sciences. Um, here you can see some of the terms that we use. So things like carbon dioxide, biodiversity, pollution, deforestation, climate change. And you can see here um, the kind of frequency across different um, syllabuses um, or sort of exam boards and subjects and what was interesting is there were some subjects, um, sorry, some exam boards that seemed to have some sort of almost like a fetish with a certain word, and it was really frequently addressed. Um, now, I do appreciate that there are sort of limitations to this sort of analysis, but the whole reason to do this was that um, there is a sense that the syllabus is almost the Bible for some teachers. So I know some teachers who, who verbatim sort of almost read the syllabus and feel like it's such, um, has so much weight behind their teaching and, and what and how they do in the classroom. And so that's why we were interested to explore that sort of relationship that actually, if you were a teacher who relied very heavily on this, actually how would that then maybe reflect on your teaching? Um, this is a good quote from, uh, this actually came from one of the science ones, but this is similar for many of the geography syllabuses. Um, it talked about um, peer reviewed uh, evidence, so obviously that's good. Um, many scientists believe that human activities, and this is where that word will comes in again, it talked about how it will cause the temperature of the Earth's atmosphere to increase, um, and that this will result in global climate change. So again, it's this sense that um, we're kind of moving it off into the future. Um, then the next bit here is particularly interesting. Um, uh, it is difficult to model such complex systems as global climate change. Um, this leads to simplified models, speculation and opinions presented in the media that may be based on only parts of the evidence and which may be biased. Hmm. That's a useful one to sort of bring in. And, and that's an interesting aspect to explore. Some of the other ones talked about a very techno-centric fix and the idea that technology and scientists coming up with solutions and they will solve this problem, which again is a sort of interesting, particularly from a geographical perspective to explore. Um, so what we did, this was um, 2019, is as a group of geography teachers, we decided that we weren't addressing uh, climate change appropriately. And there were events happening in the world more, more kind of widely. Um, and we felt that we needed to, to address that. And so what we did is um, we kind of crowdsourced a scheme of work. And this, I think, is a good example of what is possible with teachers is it's very easy now to share resources, but it's also very easy to um, to co-create using something like Google, where um, the way that we began this is we simply pose the question, what are some of the most fundamental questions we should be asking? And what was interesting is there were people from all kinds of uh, backgrounds. So there were scientists, there were people within the climate um, kind of research areas who actually proposed topics. Um, and so we used that to then whittle down. We wanted it to be a certain number of lessons long. Um, and we used that then to flesh out the content. Um, and so this was actually crowdsourced across a whole variety of teachers across the world uh, in terms of how it's come about. And then ultimately this scheme of work is publicly accessible and it's been downloaded more than 6,000 times. Um, and, and it's probably, the last time I looked um, at that number was a couple of months ago. So it's actually probably much more. Um, so we'll explore that and some of the lessons in a minute. Um, uh, here, actually, this is the link to be able to access these resources. Um, and one other thing we did as well was that we filmed a number of videos to go along with this. And I think that's another, and, and I'm sure lots of teachers are finding that now, is um, in order to help convey 
what you mean by a scheme of work or to help explain something, it's so easy now to, to create video content and to upload something to YouTube. And I know that we're using that in terms of our students, but also um, it's a really useful tool across the department as well, because there's, there's always that problem that you will pick up a scheme of work that someone else has developed and you look at one of the activities and you think, but what did they mean? Um, you know, what on earth does this slide mean? And, and it's very difficult to get inside someone's head. So those sorts of videos can be really useful. And, and that's all linked in this as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to kind of put front and center as well is that there's a number of texts that were fundamental to this scheme of work. Um, these are two by the same author by Mike Berners-Lee. Um, and this How Bad a Bananas actually is a really useful one to look at the, um, the carbon kind of intensity of different aspects of our lifestyle. So he's just released an update and what it does is it looks at everything that you do. So even something like a video call like this and, and tells you how much carbon it uses. Um, and, and that's increasingly important because we need to be thinking about the um, kind of um, the, the carbon that we emit and our personal allowance in essence and how much we can we can emit in terms of especially when we start to think about net carbon zero and getting down to, to not releasing any um, something else we did is we created and I'm a big fan of these these sorts of online quizzes so very easy to create this was a google form um, thousands of people responded um, to the link there bit.ly climate change ignorance test the reason it was called an ignorance test is it was in the vein of Hans Rosling and the Gapminder sort of tests where it's a multiple choice and the idea is it's meant to expose um, the ignorance in people's knowledge in essence um, and what's interesting is I think climate change is something that a lot of people feel knowledgeable about because it's something that they are confronted with in the media that they might talk about on a daily basis or might experience. But the reality is that some of that finer grained knowledge and detail, the real and, and what I would suggest is the really important stuff is often missing. And that came across here where um, so this was a screenshot from um, a while ago and it showed here when we had 1200 responses the average score was 14 out of 20 um there were 20 questions and, and six of them people were getting wrong which was um i thought interesting um uh here are some of the questions um these are some that i've sort of cherry picked uh and the idea is they were looking at the nuances of language. So something like climate change has only occurred in the last 140 years. Uh, what, might, what might be the obvious wrong answer, the one that people might jump to? If you put that in the chat, which do you think is the answer that students might jump to straight away when they read that? Climate change has only occurred in the last 140 years. Yeah, they might read it without thinking and say, yeah, it must be true. It's true. Climate change only occurred in the last 140 years. And that's where we, we get into this sort of language of actually, well, climate has constantly changed throughout the 4.5 billion uh, years that the Earth has existed. It's never been, um, well, I, I should be careful in the sense I'm going to say it was never stable. It has been stable within reason, within certain sort of boundaries. Um, but yeah, the premise of that one is that it's false because climate change has always occurred. What we're seeing is this sort of anthropogenic or human induced. Um, the one with the numbers, these are interesting because the, the, the tip for creating these are you take numbers um, that, that sort of are almost sound similar, but are in, um, they are like scales of magnitude different. So if someone were to guess, they, they might guess either. They're not necessarily going to be swan. Um, but just like many of the Gapminder uh, quizzes and, and questions, people always um, underestimate. So <laughs> I've, I've given this number two away, really. Um, you know, the World Health Organization do estimate that, that deaths directly linked or attributed to climate change, 150,000 each year. To me, that sounds pretty low. And, and I think it's all to do with the language of how you attribute these things. You know, what does that necessarily mean? Um, the other one that's interesting is question four. Um, which, what's the right answer for question four? Have a guess. Katie, okay, so yes. Uh, there's an element of rounding up to 40,000. And again, this is um, 
uh, a difficult number to quantify is, is at best a guess. Um, but yeah, something like 40,000. I think more accurately, people are talking about 36 or 37,000 each year now. Um, but the reality with people answering this survey online was that they were getting 4,000 because people don't think the figure's that high. Um, the, the slide I just slipped by there actually was we made another quiz based on the document that Emily Grossman made of emergency on planet Earth. And so both of these quizzes are embedded in this scheme of work and um, particularly uh, the this this one we set as the whole school or actually we did it the whole com school community so we had parents answering this we sort of uh, sent this out through our newsletter and challenged everyone in the school community to have a go at this um, and it actually resulted in some really interesting um, discussions you know over lunch or just in the corridor teachers uh, talking to students kind of sharing what they got and people were quite open about the the score that they achieved and, and that led to some really interesting discussions um, so we jump through then. Let's see. I'm just going to talk through some of the highlights, um, some of the activities that I think are really um, maybe different and interesting. Um, this first one then. This is, is based around this idea that it was in the media maybe um, six months, maybe a year ago, this question of can we just plant trees? Could we just plant our way out of climate change? And there were lots of um, organisations and um, even you know, the government and local councils who were committing to um, quotas of tree planting. And people talking about these amazing, some technology of, of a drone that could to plant trees and, and it could plant thousands a day and all this sort of stuff. And so what we said was, look, well, let's test this scientifically. And, and that's at the heart of a lot of this is thinking rather in a very loose opinion, uh, sort of uh, talking about people's opinions. It's about applying science to then think more rationally about these ideas. So this one takes students um, out of the classroom. Another important theme of this is trying to think about alternative learning experiences. So using a tree in the school grounds or just outside the school grounds or wherever your nearest tree is, um, some very simple um, uh, Pythagoras' theorem. You can simply measure the distance when stood away from a tree with um, an angle of 45 degrees up to the top of the tree and using the distance between you and the tree, you can then calculate the height of the tree and then just following um, these simple instructions, you can then uh, come up with a rough figure of how much carbon is locked away in a tree. Now, any ideas how much carbon is in an average tree? How many tons of carbon or carbon dioxide equivalent, I guess I should say, in, in the average tree? Two tons is a good guess. I don't know, maybe other people were thinking higher or lower. Um, often though, um, young people in particular, um, but I think more widely, most people have no clue how much carbon is locked away in a tree. And I think lots of people overestimate the potential for trees to lock away carbon or sequester it. Um, yeah, the average tree between one and two car uh, tons of carbon in it what we then do, though, in this worksheet is um, think, well, OK, for my annual carbon emissions. So on average, people in the UK emit just above five tonnes of carbon dioxide um, each year. So we'd need to plant five trees every year and allow them to grow full height to 100, 150 years in order to sequester that one year. Um, so each year we would need to plant five trees each. Um, well, we can then think about how much space does a tree take? How much space have we got in the UK? Let's ignore the land use and the way that, that you know, all the buildings we've got already. How quickly would we cover the whole of the UK in trees? Um, you come up with a figure of something like 12, 13 years before you've covered the whole of the UK in trees. And then you need to leave those trees to grow for 100 years anyway. And, and what it get students to do is to reflect on that idea that actually there isn't necessarily a simple solution um, but you're getting them to, to that thinking and, and um, they're kind of coming around to that approach by having done their own piece of research so that's one aspect of this. Um, 
Okay, the next, this is um, a live feed, and actually I'll show you what the figures are right now. This is a live feed of um, electricity generation in the UK, and what it does is it breaks it down by the different types, and this, there are a whole variety of websites who present the same information. The reason I like this is because it breaks it down by um, fossil fuels, renewables, and other, and so you can see at the moment that um, you, know, you might be surprised by 4% of electricity at the moment is coming from coal-fired power stations. I think most people might think coal, long gone, not, not using it in the UK anymore. But the reality is we are. Um, uh, so 30% renewable. Now, what do you think is one of the most fundamental things that affects the breakdown between fossil fuels or renewable production for our electricity? So on a day-to-day -day basis, just in the chat, what, what are some of the factors that might um, affect where our electricity is coming from. Yeah, definitely. So is it sunny? Is it windy? In the longer term, yes, there's some kind of government investment. Um, but in the UK, the main factor is if it's really windy outside, then we get large proportion of our electricity from wind farms. Um, if it isn't, if it's not sunny and it isn't windy, then that's when we switch. Like right now, we've got a larger proportion coming from gas-fired um, power stations. Yeah, time of day is obviously the, the, it's kind of if it's light or dark. Um, but so this is an interesting one to show students current information, kind of the most up-to-date. You know, this is live to a certain extent, um, but it's an interesting one for students to explore. Now. There is also then, you might be interested to know, um, the same sort of data, but for the world. So you can see the carbon intensity of electricity production for lots of countries, not every single country. Um, let me zoom out. There's some particularly interesting ones within Europe, which tell a certain story. Um, and what this allows you to do then is to look at and compare different countries. And again, this is kind of most up-to-date current data that we, we you can be using. Um, and you can explore the story of something like France. Well, what is it? Um, I'm sure we all know. Well, maybe throw it into the chat. What's the, the reason that uh, France maybe has a low carbon um, electricity generation? Yeah, nuclear. And then you've got countries in... Let me see if I can find uh, other parts. Apologies. Um, Click the wrong button there. Uh, the arrows are movement of um, so. Across the whole world, people are sharing electricity generation. You know, you might be surprised that it's coming across the channel. There's a cable that connects us to Europe, um, and you can see electricity production and how it moves between different countries. And that's what the arrows are. Um, but we've got parts of Eastern Europe, particularly somewhere like let me get we've got in the Ukraine, Estonia. I might be the one I'm looking for. It hasn't got data running at the moment. Um, but it's interesting to see how other parts of the world have different carbon intensities and how they fit the sort of narrative. You know, we've got this idea that parts of Scandinavia are much greener, using far more um, renewable energy uh, to produce electricity, obviously Iceland. And then we can think about this. Um, at the moment, there's not much data showing, but it shows you by state. And obviously, then you can think about the story across the US in terms of the southern states and, and where kind of the majority of the oil production occurs and all those sorts of things. Um, so another really good resource that students can explore. In the scheme of work, there is a table, there is the kind of structure that you could just lift and use with your students. And what I'd also say is a lot of the material in this scheme of work very easily translates to a kind of online learning format as well. Um, there is very clear instruction for, for students to be able to kind of explore in their own in their own time. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. Ah, okay, I've got to show you this one. This is a really good animation of um, carbon emitted by countries. Now, a lot of the debate uh, when you talk about who's responsible for um, kind of climate change, who's responsible for tackling it. I mean, which country do you think students would often jump to? 
and it's part of the narrative and the discussion in the UK, actually, you know, when I, uh, you know, speak to people and you say, look, we need to do more. Yeah. The response is often, but what about China? Um, and often that negates this idea that actually most of the uh, manufacturing that is emitting uh, carbon dioxide in China is actually being used to produce goods that maybe other parts of the world are consuming. So there's an interesting dynamic there as well. But I'll show you this. Um, and so it begins the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The UK is the world leader. We found coal first and we had this is just going to come up to kind of almost 1900. And you can do this live with students. You can play it and you can say, look, take a guess. Who's going to be the winner at the end? Who, who, where is the UK going to be? So at the moment, it's number one. Will it be in the top 10? To the US racing off. So 1911, it took over the UK. We've still got Germany, France, lots of other European countries. It's the different colours represent different regions of the world. So you've got kind of Europe, you've got South America, North America. Um, so 1940, any sign of China yet? So 1948, 1950, has China just popped in there? No. Oh, yeah, it has. So 19, late 1950s, China popped in the top 10. And how quickly is China going to take off? Is it going to end at the top? So I didn't know if people already started. Well, maybe have a guess. Who do you think is going to be at the top of this? Who's going to have emitted the most carbon throughout human history? Which country do you think is going to be at the top of this? Will it be China or will it be the US? Yeah. So this is the most uh, current that this shows. Um, and it shows you that actually the USA has emitted the most throughout human history. But actually, if you look, the UK is fifth in this ranking. And so that's you can then use this to shape the discussion around responsibility and who um, kind of who should we point the finger at if we were going to do that, if that was part of what we wanted to think about. Um, OK, that, that then leads on to um, this. And, and this is also an aspect of it is this idea of, of carbon equity or climate justice, which I think is an important one um, that geographers address. And we don't just simply focus on the science, you know, Milankovitch cycles and um, uh, kind of future uh, temperature change. This is an interesting discussion to have in terms of um, wealth and its relationship to carbon emissions, because what this shows is that actually uh, it's a very small proportion. It is around 10% um, of the richest people in the world who are emitting almost 50% of carbon dioxide emissions. And this graphic comes from Oxfam. Um, and what you can then start to think about is, well, actually, is it a very small proportion of the world who need to change their lifestyle? Is it a very small proportion of the world who actually need to think about this uh, climate change in a different way and um, think about their carbon emissions? And actually, the poorest 50% of people in the world, within this idea of, of um, equity and justice, maybe they should be emitting a little bit more and so actually those sorts of people, um, we should be able to lift um, or change their lifestyle in a way that makes their lives better. And they might actually emit more carbon as a result. So the idea of climate justice is an interesting one to explore. Um, and that sort of champagne glass is an interesting graphic. Um, the other thing I wanted to throw in here as well was, was and this is, is addressed in one of the lessons, is this idea of the difference between individual action, sorry, individual action, and much broader um, top down sort of government or uh, companies and the, the idea of system change and where does that responsibility lie and um, I haven't used this with students yet, but um, there is a quote, there is um, a story that I heard that, that I was going to just show kind of explain. Um, someone told me this analogy that actually, if you were to think about the um, kind of domestic abuse or the treatment of women or patriarchy. Now, if you disagreed with that, would you on an individual basis continue to beat your wife or treat women badly, even though you, because you then appreciate this idea that it's much broader system changes needed in order to change that. And so there's an analogy with this idea of our actual behavior as well. So it's worth changing individual actions 
um, even though you might then appreciate that they don't have um, the scale of impact. Um, but obviously this idea of collective action then multiplies that. Um, but we can have both, it's not an either or. So what I'm trying to get out with that story is to say, look, um, it's important for students to realize that their individual actions do have impact and convey to society their feeling and sense, as well as this idea that we might demand more broader system change. And that's something that that's, there's a discussion in the lesson uh, um, about that as well. Um, so just to finish on, this is just the last minute or two. Um, what this scheme of work does is then look to the future, and I think that's an important aspect of geography, is to also then think about um, the probable and possible future. And both of those are different in the sense that probable is what's most likely, but just because something isn't likely doesn't mean it won't happen. And I think that's an interesting perspective to bring to students. Um, when I um, speak to young people, they often feel that they are on a conveyor belt, that life is happening around them, and that they have very little agency to change it or to change that. Um, but what this scheme of work does is also gets them to appreciate the impact of their own actions and the ability they have to change the world in the sense that what they do now has an impact into the future. And the way that that's addressed in a kind of scientific sense is to say, look, here are some uh, temperature um, models and predictions based on different um, policy decisions. And to say, look, none of these are actually set in stone. Um, we don't know what temperature change there will be we can talk about what is most likely depending on a number of different scenarios um, and depending on choices and the choices we make right now, we can change those. Um, what it also then does is bring in this uh, graphic. Now this one, I think is an interesting one to think about this sense of urgency and about if we wait or we continue to wait and delay the, um, the, the change, what we do is we create a steeper and steeper cliff and it shows to get to net carbon zero or to get to zero carbon the the type of change that's needed and um yeah the kind of steeper that that gets the longer we wait so that's quite an interesting diagram to explore as well with students and, and there's material in the, in the lessons to do that so what i've got just to finish here is this is a summary of um of possible actions that come from someone called mark maslin who's um, an academic at UCL, he's a geographer at UCL. And what he prioritizes this idea is to say, actually what's most important as well is to talk about the climate change and the cri climate crisis. So I guess as, as teachers, we have a really powerful um, tool or potential there in order to do more of that. But it also ranks a lot of the other, the significant changes that we can do within our own lifestyles or that we could affect in school community or within people that we meet. So I think that's, that's an interesting one. Um, I am going to stop there and I think Louise was maybe, are we going to, to open yeah, up for some broader questions? Yeah. So if anyone's got any questions, can you post them in the chat now then please? Let's see if any questions come off. Don't know I'm going to just get the link to the presentation so that I, anyone who wants to can have a look at the resources. Um, I'll just put that into the chat. That's a link to this presentation. And as I said, all of the um, resources I've used are linked in that. So the best way to find the scheme of work is actually to use this short link, which is uh, teach climate truth. You copy that into your browser, that will take you to the scheme of work. Great, I don't think it looks like anyone's got any questions there. Well, thank you very okay. much for, no, thank you. Um, I mean, yeah, that was a fabulous presentation. I've written down loads of things there that I can forward on to my department for them to use. Um, so thank you very much. So if no one's got any questions, just a couple of things. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you for everybody for listening, that was absolutely brilliant. Can I just, oh, hang on a minute, hang on. Oh, there's somebody there, thank you. Um, chat oh, I missed that there, sorry, Paul. Let me just see what, I don't know if you wanna read the chat there. 
it's just or someone saying that they way. would use it with their they're a science teacher but they would share it with their geography department and i think also um yeah hopefully you can see how elements of this could be used by a variety of different teachers and it might be that you use some of this within your tutor group as well that, that some of this you could throw out one of these um you know the websites or, or one of the resources and get your tutees to kind of explore and discuss it um could be an interesting perspective as well there's another question here, Paul, saying, um, sorry, I can't see who this has come from on my chat. It says, my students, not all of them, still don't believe that climate change is as imminent as we say, even after showing them the data. What do you think is the best way to convince them? Best data, for example. Yeah, this is an interesting one. So my personal teaching experience of teaching this is that overwhelmingly students are apathetic I haven't necessarily experienced this idea of um, a kind of um, despair or a kind of loss of hopelessness, a kind of a loss of hope or any of that, just people being indifferent and kind of shrugging their shoulders almost. And I think that is such a challenge is um, the, the, the numbers are there. It's kind of like the, the facts are there. It's finding a way to then convey that information in a way that people kind of feel a personal um like a visceral response to and actually um aside from this scheme of work something else that we've been developing is something that has a much more um kind of personal uh, human aspect to teaching climate change there is um, a photographer who's taken some really powerful imagery um, and this is a kind of a, uh, quite a long project he's been doing where he has taken photographs of, of people stood in floods so he like so when the Somerset levels flooded he went and took photographs of people stood outside their houses stood in flood water and he went he's been to Bangladesh he's been to all parts of the world where people have experienced the impacts of climate change and those images are really powerful and that's something I think is quite a strong um, kind of way to teach this is to actually trying to get people to understand the personal stories and to because to, I think people um, you can show people a graph or a number and it's very easy to blank that and to kind of read it and ignore but if you show someone's face and the emotions um from the impacts of you know having their house flooded or from their from their sort of life being impacted in that sense it can be quite powerful um right, i'm just checking the chat there's no more questions but it'd be definitely be worth your while having a look at the comments there's lots of really positive feedback there Paul that people have given so thank you very much everyone I'm just going to read this final message on here um there's a mention there about nature because I think that's also a key theme of this as well is I think um as as teachers in general we have a responsibility to engage young people with the natural world and also to get them to think about how they are part of nature so I think we we've also got this um this natural inclination and and there was someone someone said to me it's maybe this idea of mobility and the idea that we can jump on a plane and fly and suddenly become in another place and jump in a car that feeds this idea that we are separate from nature um, and it's very easy for young people to to not really understand how every single aspect of their life is fundamentally um, relies upon nature the food they eat but also you know the, the clothes they're wearing um you know the electricity that they're using every single aspect of that is is connected to nature and i think that's something that we can we can increase the prominence of and, and be that by actually taking them physically into the natural world or outside or by just trying to emphasize that in the way that we describe and and, and talk about these things all right there's a question there asking for the name of the photographer that you were referring to um I will quickly find that. Uh, oh, Gideon Mendel, and the, the series is called Drowning World. Um, so we've got in draft some teaching resources linked to this as well um, that we're about to publish in the coming weeks. Um, so th this isn't his website, but this is a story linked to it. It shows you some of the imagery. Um, Oh, that's fabulous. Final call on any questions, anybody? There's been lots of really positive comments and fabulous feedback. Yeah, good evening. The, 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 one of the other things that came up in that chat, I think, as well, is this idea of the sort of helplessness. It's, it's something that's fundamental 
for me and I hope other teachers appreciate that as well is that it's our responsibility to help young people realize the agency that they have and um the kind of positive impact and I think that's uh, so I only in the last week watched um I am Greta the Greta Thunberg documentary and for me that had a really powerful impact um partly seeing how she is very much a normal um child so there's images of her dancing and singing and, and playing and then you see the contrast of her stood in front of uh, the, the un and these world leaders and saying the things she says but, but i think she is just a normal child uh, you know it's very easy to say she's just a normal child but um she is a child just like everyone else and um I think, yeah, connecting young people with their agency and getting them to actually do, I think that's powerful. And there are elements of this scheme of work that do encourage doing, be it a conversation or engaging someone to talk about climate change is the beginning of, of, of doing. Um, somebody's asking, Paul, if you could send the Google Docs links for the Emily Grossman article. That, that one is definitely linked within the presentation. So if you access the link to the presentation and find the image of it, you'll be able to click that. Yeah, there is also the website. So this, this is part of much broader. I've been over the last few years releasing kind of, I guess I would call them alternative or radical schemes of work. So these aren't schemes of work that simply convey fact and information. It's not about rote learning. It's about engaging on people in kind of a critical discourse about the world around them. So I'm about to publish, um, I've not got the book here, but Who Owns England? And um, uh, there's a similar book called Trespass. Um, and, and that scheme of work is going to explore um, land ownership and um, kind of explore ideas of access and inequality. Um, but again, that's very much through a kind of alternative approach to, to teaching and, and really being engaging young people in, a, in kind of a discussion and, about the world around them. But sorry, the reason I said all of that is because that's all accessible on the website um, and you can access some of those. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Paul. That was excellent. I think everyone was really engaged there and the questions have been, well, you can just see from the feedback alone how positive everyone is. It's been fab fabulous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brenda, would you just be able to put this, share the slide for us just with the talks? Yes. Coming up. That would be fabulous. Thank you very that much. Up. Here we go. So these are the, the over the next sort of few weeks, there are a couple more to be added in there. Um, so if you want to take a screen grab of that, anyone? Uh, I cannot see that at the moment, Brenda. Do... I'm not sure it's. Oh, can on. you not? Okay, all right, I will try that again. No, no it's disappeared somehow. Um, let me just try. You can see I'm trying to save it and reopen it quickly. <laughs> well, just while Brenda's trying to do that, if anyone would like a certificate of attendance, if you email me at louisemarleycorburn at gmail.com with your name, I can get a certificate sent out to you. Um, next, our next event is on the 25th of January with Peter Glaze, uh, who's going to be doing a geophotography, how photography reflects and influences our change in geography, as you can see there. Has uh, it come up? Great. It has. Fabulous. Yeah. Um, I don't, and like Brenda said, if you want to take a photograph, a screenshot it of the upcoming talks that we've got, there's a massive range of talks going on until the end of March that we'll be offering. OK, so thanks very much, everybody, for attending. And we look forward to seeing you at our future talks. And thanks again, Paul. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And thanks very much to Louise and, and Carl as well for, for getting this out there. Fantastic. Yeah. A real team effort. <laughs> right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Have you stopped recording yet?